Hello, everybody. Welcome again to another edition of the MCHD Paramedic Podcast. This is Dr. Casey Patrick, and joining me today, our regular guest, Medical Director Dr. Rob Dixon. Good afternoon, Casey. And today we're going to bring back the Monday Morning Quarterback Series. This has been one we've gotten awesome feedback on, so thank you all for, as the listeners for watching and listening uh, to this series that we've added. We, we think it adds some value because we get to talk about our cases as emergency physicians that we interact with our medics here in Montgomery County. So pretty, pretty excellent uh, way to, to generate some synergy, to use a, uh, a word that I try to avoid. But these are your cases. Today's Monday morning quarterback or Dr. Dixon's cases uh, from the county uh, relatively recently, uh, not, not yesterday. Um, so I'll let you lead it off with the first one because there's definitely some lessons for everyone that provides emergency care, whether you're an uh, EMT, an AMT, a paramedic in the pre-hospital setting, whether you're an emergency department nurse, uh, and resident, emergency physician, seasoned. This is one that's got tons of usefulness for us all and good reminders. So, so take it into case one. Yeah, thanks, Casey. This one made me really go back and, and get into uh, the, the PCARN rule and, and reading about head injury. I mean, I knew the rule and I utilized the rule all the time, but it really made me go back and kind of look at the details. Um, this was a case I saw recently. It's a three-week-old child. Uh, mom brought the kid in. She had the baby in a uh, the little car seat and how the handles lock. They lock back and they lock in the mid position. I guess they lock down. Well, the, the handle was not locked and the baby was sitting on a chair and was not strapped in the seat. Mom picked up the, the baby carrier and it flipped forward and the child flipped out of the uh, baby carrier onto the floor. Uh, this is a fall of maybe a couple of feet. I believe it was to a tiled floor. Uh, the child cried immediately. Um, it had occurred about an hour before she brought the child to the emergency department. She arrived by a private vehicle, said the child had been acting normally since um, normal birth history. It was a, a vaginal delivery and otherwise uncomplicated. Uh, child was well, had actually fed once between the injury and when I examined the child. So normal acting baby. Um, on the clinical examination, uh, I undressed the child completely. Only finding was a cephalohematoma, had a parietal uh, cephalohematoma, but wasn't tender. Baby, baby cooed, had a proper startle reflex as they will uh, at that age. I, I felt the fontanelle was open, was nice and soft. So nothing to really raise my suspicion other than the little uh, mild cephalohematoma the baby had. So there's some pieces in there we, I want to pull out and review for the listeners. So you talked about utilizing PCARN rule. So let's talk about clinical decision rules first, and then we'll sort of walk our way into what PCARN is. What's the decision rule that we use the most in EMS? Probably one of the more impactful emergency studies over the past couple of decades, and that's cervical spine clearance. Yeah. And we use a combination of the Canadian C-spine rules. And the, and the Nexus rule. For and Nexus correct. rule. What we use here. Yeah, here at MCHD. And what a clinical decision rule is, or most of them, there are knee radiograph rules, ankle radiograph rules. There are rules for lumbar puncture in intracerebral hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage workup. There's the PCARN head injury rules. There's, I, I could go on for the next 20 minutes. The bottom line is, is these are ways that we can use our clinical exam and history and com combining those two in attempt to determine who needs further testing, whether it's radiographic testing, whether it's invasive testing like a lumbar puncture, and try to limit those. Right, and just like any, any test or rule there is no perfect test and there is no perfect rule but these are are usually generated out of large studies that look at lots and lots of people like the nexus the emergency x-ray utilization study lots and lots tens of thousands of people uh, and then they looked at the criteria and how many of those people who met those criteria had a significant injury and the same kind of with the pecan rule so it's just it's a it's a decision tool that tries to help us decide 
who should get an appropriate imaging study. In this, in this case, it would have been a CT imaging of the, of the child. So PCARN is the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, and they, as a group, try to streamline and standardize our workup and our approach to taking care of pediatric patients in the emergency department. And so in this case, this was a young child who had fallen, suffered a head injury. Do we need to get a CT scan of the brain on this patient or not? And the the important piece, the valuable piece to the population and to the public is, yeah, we could CT scan all of these patients, but that's radiation to a young, growing, developing child, especially spots like their thyroid gland, which is right there in the neck, which is very sensitive to radiation. So applying this rule allows us to say, hey, do we need to get a CAT scan or not? And the data from this comes from the Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2021. And the rule contains some pretty obvious points and then some that are more subtle that we'll, we'll bring out in this case. So if a child is not normal and doesn't appear well, Guess they, what? They need a CAT scan. They get a CAT scan. So GCS yeah. less than 15 get CAT scans. If they're suffered or if they have suffered or did suffer loss of consciousness for greater than five seconds, they get a CAT scan. That kind of makes sense. Severe mechanism of injury is one that that makes sense. There's some caveats there. Hold that thought. And then hematomas and hematomas in patients who are less than two years old are important. And that's because the skull is not uh, fully calcified. The sutures are not uh, fully fused. And the, and the presence of hematomas are good predictors of potential s- skull fracture and, and, furthermore, intracerebral injury. Now, that skull fracture and that scalp hematoma is more likely if it's a non-frontal hematoma. So thickest part? frontal scalp, frontal skull. So we treat hematomas in the emergency department differently. And this one, where was your hematoma? It was uh, parietal. Parietal. So that's, parietal. In, that's in a danger spot. And, you know, this discussion, and it's a great discussion. I, I love the pecan rule. And these doctors did, uh, clinicians did a great job developing this because it, it helped streamline and organize our practice in this country and really around the world. We apply this rule it helps us there in, in the emergency department, but it also helps with parents, right? I print this out and I give it to the parents and say, there's no perfect rule or test, but here's what happened when we applied this to 10,000 children. And I think it really gives them a sense that, hey, it's okay that my child, it's okay not to get a, a CAT scan. So here on the podcast, we're talking about PCARM, we're talking about this one. I really wanted to pick this case as well because I think there's some other nuggets in it and then we'll we'll, I'd like to talk about those nuggets that I found in this case and then we could talk about what happened with the child so I think that this case illustrates a couple things you have to start with the differential we have a child we have an injury so what's in our differential for this child you could you could have a brain injury you could have a skull fracture but you could also have non-accidental trauma. So I think one of the most important things with this, particularly any age group of child that is non-verbal, that is not able to verbalize to us, whether actually, whether that be a child or maybe it's a a senior with some cognitive disorder in the nursing home, right? To do a proper exam, we have to get that patient completely undressed. If we don't, we stand the chance of missing things like hair tourniquets and non-accidental trauma and a buttock abscess that's causing a fever or sepsis. So there's tons of diagnoses that can be missed. The other part of that is you miss the work of breathing. Those big swaddly bundles that kids are covered up in cover the the, uh, muscles of respiration, and we can really miss a ton of clinical warning signs like, hey, maybe this kid has a pneumonia, maybe this kid has sepsis, maybe this kid has an infection here. So very, very, very important. If the patient is nonverbal, please, 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 in a private and respectful way, get them undressed and have a look at them, have a proper look at them. Where's the other danger spot? The other danger spot, we sort of blew right past, but this is a danger spot. And if you're listening as a medic, you're like, well, I'm not, not going to order a CAT scan. What are, right. the, what are these guys talking about? And while you may not order the CAT scan, these rules and 
concerning findings are still important in the pre-hospital setting when we're trying to convince parents to agree to transport. Right. So what was the other big warning sign for you in the workup of this patient when you were acting as, yeah, the, as uh, a staff physician, and that was? It's the age, guys. It's the age. The clinical examination in a less than three-month-old is not reliable. It's not reliable for sepsis. It's not reliable for meningitis. And it's just not reliable for, you know, signs of distress. I palpated all over this cephalohematoma, and the kid cooed and smiled and ate the bottle, looked normal, very normal. And I'll flip to the outcome. You can always tell it's on the Monday morning quarterback. What did the kid have? A very large linear skull fracture with, without, did not, thank goodness, have subdural hematoma, but had a very large skull fracture. And so the other piece that I think I learned from this case, and I want to I stress, is that within the PCARN rule and within our own normal workup and normal thought process, we all put mechanism into play and into consideration when we're trying to determine how sick a potential trauma patient is, how sick a pediatric head injury is. Mechanism plays a role. And when you look at the severe mechanism definition within the PCARN rule, it involves things that are obvious to us. If the patient's in an MVC with ejection, well, okay. Yeah. Not no a surprise. Brainer. <laughs> okay. Death of another passenger in the car. No brainer. Rollover. Pedestrian or bicyclist without a helmet struck by a motorized vehicle. Makes all, sense. all of those right. make total sense. But then you've got the last one. And this is where a three month old, Dr. Dixon gave the story about mom picked up the car carrier, the, the handle wasn't latched, it snapped forward and flipped the baby out. Falls of more than three feet qualify in children less than two years old. Falls of more than three feet. So those first four or five are absolute no-brainers. But a three-foot fall for a, for a three-month-old or a two-month-old is considered high mechanism. So to me, that's worth remembering. As a parent of three teenagers now, I also can totally empathize with this parent dumping this baby on the floor. Uh, I, I've been there, done that. So considering non-accidental trauma I is totally huge. I totally considered it. The, the story, the history, the historians were consistent. It was appropriate. And then the second half of that is always examine, right? Always look, because you don't know what you're going to find. You can find pattern bruising, bruising where it shouldn't be, uh, injury patterns on children that are not consistent with this mechanism. This case, though, the parent's uh, history was consistent, the injury was consistent, and I thought it was very low risk for non-external trauma injury. Bottom line, even with the PCARN rules applied appropriately, 5% of the kids in the study, the, the very young group very in young. that study, had abnormal CT findings. Uh, so really, PCARN, when I applied in my practice going forward, even for the less than two year group, because there are two rules, there's less than two and greater than two for pediatric patients. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to the fact that just exactly like you said it, less than three month old, really yes. all bets are off. It's probably a good time to be overcautious, not to over radiate for absolutely no reason, but if there's anything close to an abnormality there, I'm gonna be cautious in that age group. Yeah, I agree. And, that's, agree. and that's, that was kind of the point for this case when I thought, well, it's not too sexy of a case. But then it had a lot of nuggets in it, which is the exam and non-accidental trauma and the reliability. And really what we one of the things that we'll finish on with this when we'll get on to the next case that we didn't touch on is just the inherent danger in the first three months of life. They are fragile. Their immune systems are not developed. They're at far greater risk for sepsis. They're at far greater risk for non-accidental trauma. So it, unreliable examination and very, very risky age group, I think, of patients that we encounter. We'll attach the PCARN rules in the show notes so you all can have a look. Just beware of less than three months. It's a, it's a good way to, to approach these folks and to have a little bit of knowledge about some of these decision rules can go a long way to help convince reluctant parents to agree to transport. So yeah. that was case one. Case two, we're going to have to add some visual aids. So if you're a podcast listener, listen away. We'll have some visual aids added in here, but I won't give it away too much. 
T- right. Take away with your case. Describe this one, your patient. This one I thought was really neat. So this is a, uh, a patient who arrives by EMS. I go and and have a visit with the crew as they're wheeling the patient in. Uh, and he's a young man in his 30s or mid 30s. Uh, and the story from the paramedics, the, the presenting complaint is altered mental status. So I kind of go back to your altered mental status, serial killers, and I'm kind of ticking the box through that list. So I'm talking to the medics, and they're give me a history of a young man that had some mental health difficulties. He um, was found in his mother's yard, kind of crawling around, eating dirt, acting very abnormally, Um, was mildly to moderately agitated with the paramedics, Um, initially followed commands and they were able to get him on the stretcher, but then he became a little bit agitated with the monitoring, taking the monitoring off, so he'd received Um, some midazolam sedation prior to arrival and he was in restraints. Uh, On my initial clinical examination, uh, he didn't have any outward sign of trauma. Uh, He was very hyperdynamic. He was tachycardic, I believe, in the 130-ish range. Uh, The blood pressure was in the 160s or 170s. Uh, Not terribly tachypnic, maybe a little bit tachypnic. His skin was dry and he he would try to follow commands. I was trying to get him to follow commands. He was not, I was not able to really hear him verbalize. He was kind of grunting. He would look at me and then kind of get distractible and pull at the restraints and things. So that's kind of how the case started. So good, good spot to review the ultra mental status serial killer. So you checked the boxes. It checked in. Actually, I did ask the medics and very astutely, what's the number one you checked there that they would have? They checked a glucose already and I can't remember the number. It was in the normal to maybe high normal range. So check glucose or endocrine. I uh, asked them about, did he have any seizure history? There was no report of any convulsions or seizure. Uh, Stroke always has to be in the differential, but low, somewhat low vascular risk, even though it can happen in young people, is still somewhat on the differential. Hyperdynamic, it could have been an intracranial hemorrhage, maybe a hypertensive hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, Infectious, and then the, the common toxins. Uh, part of the other part of that history is the mother also verbalized to the medics on scene she was not there that uh, when um, he occasionally the patient when he got hold of some money that he liked to party and he uh, had used substances of some kind before they weren't really sure what kind and he had had episodes like this where it uh, exacerbated his mental health problems so there's some things we do early on in patients like this and in the emergency department to try to tease out between those ultra mental status patients. Hopefully our, our EMS crews have the, the sugar for us, but we're thinking about brain imaging and sedating them appropriately so that we can obtain CT scan of the brain. One of the things that can get lost in there though, and oftentimes our pre-hospital partners should have this for us, and that's a 12 lead. Why yeah, is a 12 that, lead important? That was one of the things that I forgot to actually ask them about. So I got him to a room. He, I was worried about him struggling against the, the, the uh, restraints a bit. Uh, and my staff and his monitoring situation, I really wanted to get him under control so we could get proper monitoring on him, get him imaged. Uh, and get some diagnostic tests, including a 12 lead EKG. So I init- my initial opening gambit is I sedated him. I used uh, droperidol to sedate the patient. That sedated him well. I used 10 milligrams and um, sedated him. And one of the first tests that we got was, you'll see figure one, we'll put it in the show notes, was this AK- EKG here. This is his initial 12 lead. So if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see overlay EKG one. So that's EKG1. Uh, the patient was hemodynamically stable. I'd have been more concerned if he was hemodynamically compromised. But a couple of things jumped out at, at me on this one, case. He's just, number one, look at the LVH on this. This is a kid, you know, so hyperdynamic, this big, big LVH. And then the widening of the QRS, clearly concerning to me. Uh, especially in this age group, when it looks like a left bundle, when it looks that wide, I think about toxins, hyper-K, toxins, hyper-K, toxins, hyper-K. So I was worried about a sodium channel toxin. I did think, well, man, he's in his late 30s. He's got LVH. Maybe it's his baseline. So I went to the our database there. Sadly, we had not looked after him or done an EKG. I had no comparison. 
LVH to me is always a little bit of a, eh, some hypertension from a young age, big muscular, young heart. You can see some normal variant LVH in younger patients. It should be a concerning thing for you, thinking about things like hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy should be on the list. But I, I see LVH sometimes in young patients. A widened QRS in a young patient. It got my attention. It got my attention. Is, <laughs> is really, really, for the most part, right. abnormal every single time. Yeah. So when we think about toxins versus hyper-K, there's some overlap in treatment there. And honestly, there's some fairly benign treatments there that, if we're correct, can go a long way in treating the patient and can go a long way in diagnosing the patient. So you said, well, it could be hyperkalemia. It could be a sodium channel blocker. What are you going to give them? I went with the most likely, guys. I got, I got a tox history. The exam was consistent with the toxin on the patient's clinical examination, his behavior, his mental status. I went ahead and went with that first. I gave him uh, 50 milli equivalents of sodium bicarbonate. And your diagnosis was absolutely cinched, wrapped up, neat, nice bow on top. I thought it was pretty cool. Like delivered. It, was, it was immediate. And I saw it on the monitor and I asked the nurse, can you shoot another 12 lead of that? And it was literally, it's, it's just like hypercates. It's so satisfying. It's like draining an abscess. You get immediate satisfaction. His QRS just narrowed down. It was, it was pristine. And we'll put figure two there. And what you see on your screen now, guys, is his follow-up 12 lead cardiogram. Immediately following the sodium bicarbonate. And as a, as a review, if you overdose on lots of toxins, textbook is tricyclic antidepressants. That's what you'll see in your textbook. That was the most commonly used antidepressant back in the 80s when the textbooks were written. Or yeah. at least that's what we assume. Not very common now. <laughs> Migraines, maybe. Um, but there are a lot of other commonly used drugs and abused drugs that also widen the QRS and block sodium channels. Methamphetamines and cocaine, cocaine in large doses can do that. Um, propranolol, methadone, Benadryl, lots of antipsychotic and uh, atypical antipsychotic drugs can do that. And we could keep making a list from here out the door of the podcast room. The point being is you suspected toxins, whether it was illicit or prescribed. He had a picture that fit. He had an EKG that was concerning. In this situation, 50 milliequivalents of bicarbonate are absolutely minimal risk to see if we can get some results. And what you saw from figure one to figure two was a finger snap, just immediate immediate. resolution of his widening of uh, the QRS. It takes him out of any risk for further you know, rhythm decompensation, and you know what you're dealing with. Right, and that's the worry here, right? The worry here is that this can degenerate into a worsening dysrhythmia that has hemodynamic consequences. Uh, This patient did quite well. Uh, His mental status improved slowly over the next several hours. I was able to image him. He had a negative CAT scan. Uh, His lab was fairly consistent with uh, this toxidrome. Uh, He had a little bitty bump in his cardiac markers without any findings of acute ischemia on his follow-up ECG. He was hospitalized, fluid supportive care. Uh, By the time he was getting ready to go to the floor, his mental, he was cooperative. I I released his restraints and he was cooperative and with his care. So actually really probably gonna be a really good outcome for this young guy. So let's, let's take it home. Two great cases uh, really illustrate some of the things we've talked about on the podcast before and when we've talked about the pediatric assessment trial uh, or triangle, when we've talked about, uh, you know, toxin management and the serial killers for altered mental status. Uh, these two really summarize in, in the real world how, how we can apply uh, these, these concepts. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a brewery brief resolved unexplained event formerly known as alti trauma fever infection non-accidental trauma anything less than three months should be concerning very concerning and for us in, in ems what does that mean it means really having a good discussion with the parents or the caregivers of the importance of a hospital evaluation of these children they're very very difficult to sort out at that age if you see an altered patient you're concerned for toxins wide QRS on the EKG, wide QRS, 
plus young plus altered equals bicarbonate. Just and you'll know if it's the offender because your repeat AKG will look markedly narrower, yeah. more narrow, narrower if you're if you're correct. And why is that? Just quick review. Sodium channel blockade. Sodium channel blockade. Overwhelm that with the most concentrated sodium we have on the truck, sodium bicarbonate, and it fixes the problem. Decision tools, lastly, are just that. They're decision tools. They're not decision laws written in stone. So if you have a patient that you're concerned about their neck for whatever reason, then at this point in this country, we'll put a collar on them. Yeah, we can always take it off. If you have a patient that you're concerned about transport and you think it's a high risk situation and it qualifies as a high risk refusal, even if it's outside of our high risk boundaries that we've set here at MCHD with age less than one and abnormal vital signs, if they're 13 months old and you're concerned, call a chief, call one of the doctors, escalate it. A lot of times it's that next person in the room that can convince these parents to, to allow transport to the hospital. Excellent couple cases for yeah, today. Thank you. Good, good weekend. Really solid points that overlay nicely with some of the things we've already talked about here on the podcast so as always thank y'all for watching and listening if you have ideas for future podcasts please shoot us an email podcast at mchd-tx.org i actually love getting those emails and hearing from our listeners so don't hesitate to ask us a question send us an idea it's greatly greatly appreciated it is guys thanks for listening if you are a listener, leave us a review wherever you li- wherever you listen. We 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 like the reviews. The reviews help us uh, prop us up, more visible, get more listeners, push this thing forward. So thanks again. We'll be back again with a new episode soon.